time flows differently when you're working through a rough spot in life. It somehow speeds along and drags to a standstill all at the same time. As I watched Henry's treatment slowly wear him down, summer somehow slipped away into autumn. And before I knew it, autumn had withered and curled up into winter. I bore witness to his suffering. And I suffered along with him. Henry is a tough old buzzard, no doubt about that. But I secretly feared the neoadjuvant treatment would be the death of him before the cancer even had a chance to step up to the plate. As Henry's body declined, so did his spirit. I began to fear he was losing the will to fight against the awful disease. I spent many nights staring at the ceiling while Michelle slept beside me, thinking about the preparations which would have to be made for Henry's eventual passing. I hated myself for doing it, but I couldn't ignore the reality of his situation in favor of unrealistic hopes and wishes. Henry had made me the executor of his estate, so it would be my responsibility to oversee the ghastly business of disassembling the remnants of his earthly existence, piece by piece, until no trace of him was left. As it turns out, Henry had the granddaddy of loose ends waiting for me at the farmhouse. A nasty bit of unfinished business that'll definitely have me laying awake on many nights to come. I'll admit, I used to doubt some of the wilder details of my uncle's tall tales, but after what happened out at the farm, the weekend of Henry's surgery, I'm not so sure anymore. Henry's surgery was scheduled for early Friday morning, so Michelle and I brought him in on Thursday evening. Henry put up a tough front as always, but the fear in his eyes was heartbreaking. Michelle could barely look at him without tearing up. Two of my cousins ended up taking a few minutes in the bathroom to compose themselves in privacy. Henry is much loved in our family. Some of them couldn't even bring themselves to acknowledge the gravity of the situation. They spoke in terms of hope and recovery, ignoring the grim reality that was laid out in stark detail by the specialists in favor of waxing poetic about the huge party they would be thrown when Henry returns from the hospital. It was irritating as hell, but I understand that some people have to whistle in the dark. It's the only way they can cope with the shadows. About a week before the eve of the surgery, Henry had asked me, in a hushed and somber tone, if I'd be able to stay at the farm that weekend and take care of something for him. Given my recent state of mind, it isn't surprising that I had agreed and then promptly forgot all about it. As we were saying our goodbyes that night, Henry clasped my hand in a weak two-handed grip and looked me in the eye. He said, Don't forget, there's something I need you to do out on the farm this weekend. I wrote it all down for you in a notebook and left it on my nightstand. I winced internally and then smiled and assured him, oh, Yeah, I remember, sure. No problem. Henry looked me in the eyes and said, The sooner the better. He hesitated. He then added, You should probably plan to stay the night. You could still do that for me, right? I shot a pleading look at Michelle and said, Sure, of course. We don't mind helping you out, right, hon? Michelle forced a cheerful smile and said, Oh yeah, it's no problem. Don't worry about a thing, he'll take care of it. I have to work Saturday morning, though, so I guess he'll be on his own. Henry didn't smile back. He nodded very slightly and murmured, Probably for the best if he handles it by himself. Well, wish me luck, kids. So old man's gonna be in the belly of the beast tomorrow. We kept our goodbyes brief. It would have been too hard to leave if we didn't. And Henry needed to get some rest. I was pretty wiped out myself, but I wasn't so tired that I couldn't pick up on Michelle's sudden mood swing. I could feel the tension coming off of her in waves. After we hit the highway, I turned down the radio and asked her what was wrong. As I expected, Michelle hated the idea of not being there for each other for moral support during the days immediately following Henry's surgery. However, she also made it clear there was no way in hell she would ever consider spending the night at Henry's house, and it had nothing to do with the long drive to work in the morning. 
Not only that, but she didn't want me to spend the weekend at the farm either. Not one bit. When I asked her why, she snapped, What? Come on, are you completely oblivious? That place is haunted! I looked over at her and snorted, Haunted? <laughs> no, it's not. Why, why would you say that? She rolled her eyes and said, Oh, come on, you're telling me you've never felt it. That house is haunted as fuck, are you kidding me? I reminded her that I don't believe in that kind of thing, and she pointed out that the ghosts probably didn't care if I believed in them or not. We bickered back and forth until I finally sighed, look, let's just agree to disagree, okay? Michelle wasn't having any of it. She snapped, let's not! I can't believe you! You're that idiot in every shitty horror movie who ends up dying in the first half hour. Stop being dumb and listen to me. I'm telling you, there's a very weird and haunted vibe going on over in there at that house. That nasty root cellar? Yeah, no, no thanks. I was completely taken off guard by her anger. I, I took a deep breath and asked, where is this coming from? I mean, I, I've slept under that roof countless times over the years, and I've never seen anything weird going on, not once. Have you? Oh, not exactly, she grumbled. But I've always felt it, you know? There's nothing new. I just never had a reason to bring it up before. So what's the reason? Michelle shook her head and looked away. I reached over and gently squeezed her shoulder. Look, I don't know where this is coming from, but I promise I won't be murdered by ghosts. Scout's on her. She frowned at me and pulled away. It's not funny. Look, it probably sounds stupid or whatever, but I had a bad dream a few nights ago. An a nightmare. It was really crazy, but I can only remember the worst part. Michelle pursed her lips and shook her head. I prompted, what happened in the dream? And she was suddenly wiping tears from her eyes. You were down in the root cellar she said. And your forehead was covered in blood. You climbed the ladder and started pounding on the trap door. Something was coming for you. In the background. Something bad. You were screaming. She looked over at me with a look of naked dread in her red, watery eyes. She quavered. It was very... It was, it was very intense. It wasn't like every other dream I've ever had, you know, where everything is all fuzzy and like kind of detached from reality. I could actually smell the dirt floor. That's how real it was. I woke up in a panic. I couldn't go back to sleep for a long time. I just laid there and watched you snore. I couldn't stop shaking. Despite my skepticism regarding ghosts and all things supernatural, this imagery made me shiver a little inside the bulky confines of my winter coat. I turned up the heat a bit and said, Wow, well, I... Uh, yeah, I see. Um, look, I honestly don't think your dream was a prophecy of some kind. I, I do, however, think Henry's surgery has us both on edge. You get what I'm saying? I don't know why you think Henry lives in the house from the Amityville Horror, but... That was just a dream. Sure, it was just a dream. Michelle interrupted. But that doesn't mean I have to like any of this, right? That house is old and dark and creepy as hell. I've always hated being there after sunset. It's just this... This sense of, like, foreboding that I get when the sun goes down behind the tree line. I'll be sitting there at the table with you and Henry, and I'll keep thinking that I heard footsteps in another room. I'll see movement out of the corner of my eye, but... But when I turn my head, there's nothing there. I always feel like there's something watching us when the light fades and the windows get dark. It creeps me out. Well, I drawled. I can't say I've ever felt anything like that, but I, I can see you have a different opinion on the matter. I'm not sure what to tell you, hon. I've never seen or Michelle shushed me with a hand on my shoulder. She let out a long, shaky breath and said, Okay, fine. All that other stuff aside, my dream was very intense, and I can't stress that enough. I could feel your panic and fear. It was 
Super fucking scary, no joke. I stayed quiet for a while as I turned her words over in my mind. I had to admit there was something decidedly off. What was this chore that Henry needed me to perform exactly, and why did he need to write it down? Why didn't he just tell me what needed to be done when he brought it up a week before the surgery? Back at the hospital, Henry had told Michelle, it's probably best if he handles this by himself. And coming from Uncle Henry, the blunt delivery of this statement was pretty strange. He'd always been nothing but gracious and inviting whenever he spoke to my wife, and the way he worded his demurral had definitely sounded discouraging. For the first time in my life, I found myself wondering if Henry might have a few skeletons lurking in his closet. I knew I'd freak Michelle out even if I shared any of these thoughts with her, so I just shrugged and said, look, I don't like it either, but I have to do this. I'm the executor of the estate, right? He might have some last minute details that need to be taken care of before the farm. I trailed off. But it was too late. Michelle sat up straight in the passenger seat and asked, For what? Before the farm goes on the market. If he makes it through this, Henry wants to sell it and move into a retirement community. If he doesn't, well... It'll be sold anyway. Either way, the family farm won't be in the family much longer. Michelle digested this information for a minute in the dark, then cleared her throat and said, Well, that's too bad, honey. I know how much you love that place. It's, it's very special to you. I blinked away a sudden mist that threatened to cloud my vision. I was squeezing the steering wheel too hard, I forced myself to relax my grip. I'll miss the farm with all my heart, and, and that's a fact. I'd always secretly hoped I'd convince Henry to sell it to me someday, you know, keep the property and the family and all that. I'm no farmer, but I could have let Jonathan share crop the fields, and the harvest would have paid the property taxes. Probably a good chunk of the mortgage, too. Shit, we could have just torn the old house down, built a new one, if that's what you wanted. It's not the house I care about. It's, it's the land itself, you know. We, we could have... Gently, Michelle said, You know, we can't afford it. And I gritted my teeth in a sudden flash of white-hot fury. I felt small, helpless, profoundly ashamed of my failure. Before long, the farm would pass into the hands of a stranger, and the very thought... It was intolerable. The farm didn't belong to some hypothetical dickhead with money to burn. It belonged to us, goddammit. My family had wrestled a difficult living from that soil for many, many decades, struggling through droughts and floods, bad harvests and personal tragedies, forever toiling in the dirt as we labored towards building a better future. It was unfathomable that someone could just swoop in and snatch away our history with a few scrawled signatures and a pile of cash. It was... It was almost obscene. I know we can't afford it. I croaked. And I turned the radio on. To a volume that made further conversation impossible. I needed some time to turn off my brain and lose myself in the flow of traffic. I didn't say another word for the rest of the way home. There was nothing left to say. We both slept poorly that night, and we dragged ourselves out of bed early in the morning for the long trek back to the hospital. We were directed to a waiting room full of anxious-looking strangers. Everyone was pale and exhausted. There was some murmured conversation, but most of them sat in silence. It wasn't long before my eyelids started getting heavy. I gave Michelle a pleading look, and she patted her shoulder. I whispered, thank you. I nestled up against her for a little nap. She rubbed my hand and went back to her book. 
Some grisly thing about a serial killer in the Midwest. She may be deathly afraid of ghosts, but my wife sure does love her true life horror stories. I woke up in a state of deep confusion. It was dark in the waiting room, the floor was jouncing around beneath my chair, and Michelle's hooded sweatshirt stank like old booze and stale cigarette smoke against my cheek. She pushed me off her shoulder with an irritated grunt and said, Get the fuck off me, kid. I'm trying to drive here. It wasn't Michelle sitting next to me. It was my dad. And the plastic chairs had been replaced with the bench seat in Dad's old Chevy pickup truck. It was the dead of night, and I was wearing my winter coat over my pajamas. I blinked up at him and yawned. Where are we going? Dad glared at me, swerving onto the shoulder of the road in the process. He snarled, don't worry about that. Scoot over there, lay your head against the window, go back to sleep. He lit up a cigarette, and I saw a big bloody scrape on his forehead and the wavering glow of his zippo. I was tired. Cold. Absolutely brimming with questions, but I kept my mouth shut and did as I was told using the hood of my winter coat as a makeshift pillow to cushion my head against the glass. Dad lowered his voice to a harsh whisper and hiss. You don't tell your mother about this. You don't tell anyone about this, you hear me? Just forget about it. Go back to sleep. I murmured. I won't tell. And closed my eyes. I fell asleep to the dull rumble of the road beneath the tires. When I opened them again, I was back in the present, slumped over in a chair in a hospital waiting room. Michelle was gently shaking me by the shoulder. Wake up, she whispered. The doctor's here. We followed the doctor to a small meeting room where she sat us down and calmly explained the next few days would be critical. I feel your uncle's chances of long-term recovery are pretty decent, she said. But we did encounter some complications during the operation. It was nothing out of the ordinary, but Henry's condition is very delicate at the moment. I leaned forward in my chair and told her very firmly that Henry would make it because Henry is a fighter. I was faintly aware that my hands were clenched together in my lap. I nodded a little too vigorously and added, There's no way he'd let this thing win. Not, Hen not Henry. He's a force of nature. Absolutely she said, and I saw in her eyes that it didn't matter. The outcome would be determined with a roll of the dice by the hand of blind fate. We could only stand by and hope. Michelle volunteered to drive on the way home, and I spent most of the ride staring out my window with a lump of lead in my stomach. The dream I had in the waiting room was actually an old and mostly forgotten memory from my early childhood. I examined this fragment from my past as the miles slipped beneath us, and I realized I could remember a little bit more. I could recall looking out of my bedroom window and seeing Henry standing with my dad in the driveway. Henry looked like he was extremely agitated, his breath streaming from his mouth and long plumes of white as he waved his arms in the air. He helped my dad drag something out of the bed of Dad's old pickup, and they loaded it into the back of Henry's truck. It was a long, cylindrical object, wrapped tightly in a canvas tarp, bound the length of the rope. Afterwards, Dad came upstairs, packed some of my old clothes, and bundled me in a coat. And then we went... Where? And why? And most importantly, what was in that tarp? And why was this memory giving me so much anxiety? Superstitious or not, I couldn't help but feel that Michelle's dream and my fragmented memory were somehow connected. Even if they weren't connected, it was still weird as fuck, and, and I didn't like it. Not one bit. It was after four by the time we pulled into our driveway. 
Despite a last-ditch effort from my wife to convince me to stay, I filled my travel mug with coffee, packed a few things in my overnight bag, and gave her a hug goodbye. She seized me by the arm and demanded, You must have your phone turned on within reach at all times. I know that sounds stupid, and I don't care. I'm not fucking around here. Do it. I know you aren't. And I will. I promise. Let me know right away if the hospital calls about Henry. Bye, hon. Michelle came out to our balcony and watched me back out of our parking spot, something she hasn't done in a very long time. I waved to her as I started to drive away, but she didn't wave back. She was more than a little freaked out by the whole situation, and to be honest, I was starting to get kind of nervous myself. I couldn't shake the feeling I was about to wander whole and breathing right into one of Henry's tall tales. I cleared my throat, looked at myself in the rearview mirror, and said out loud, Stop being a goddamn idiot. This house isn't haunted. I knew I was full of shit as soon as the words tumbled off my lips. There were countless memories waiting for me within those walls. And what are memories if not spectral reflections of the past? Oh yeah, there'd be many memories, good and bad, and there are probably a few secrets as well. Now, some secrets are best left to rot away in the root cellar of a bygone era, but others can take root and bear poisonous fruits in the dark. Some secrets must be exposed. They'll ruin everything you've ever held dear in your heart. Denial is a luxury for those who have time to spare. And Henry's time on this planet was coming to an end. I had a sinking feeling Henry may have been keeping a secret that would not quietly die along with him. And he breathed his last. I didn't have the faintest clue what was in store for me at the farmhouse, and frankly, I wasn't looking forward to finding out. It was late afternoon by the time I pulled into the laneway, and the sky was just beginning to turn red in the west as the sun sank below the tree line. My breath streamed out in long, wispy clouds as I clenched through the snow to the back door. I let myself in, kicked off my boots, and immediately started turning on all the lights. I tiptoed from room to room with a heavy candlestick clutched in my hand, and my makeshift weapon poised to crack any ghostly skulls as I reached around gloomy corridors to flick on a light switch. I mean, I knew I was being ridiculous. But it made me feel better. And that was all that mattered. When all the shadows had been dispelled to their hiding spots in the corners, I felt absurdly relieved. I thought to myself, apparently, ghosts can only get you in the dark. And I let out a shaky little giggle. I sighed. There. All better now. I slung my coat over the back of the couch. Now that the monsters had been banished by the cleansing glow of electric light, my stomach decided to unclench itself and start rumbling. I scavenged around in the kitchen and fixed myself a double-decker sandwich, complete with a dill pickle and a handful of potato chips on the side. I snapped on the old radio Henry kept on the kitchen counter and sat down to my dinner. The shocking blue sang, Can You Feel My Love Buzz? Henry was particularly fond of a station that mostly played rock and roll classics from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, an era which Henry referred to as back when they could actually sing a goddamn song. As I was shoveling the last potato chip into my mouth, I got a text from Michelle. It read, Hi, are you still alive? I answered, Yep, still breathing, having a bite to eat. What are you doing? Worrying about stuff. Have you had a chance yet to look at the instructions he left for you? What was so important that he had you take care of it on the week of his surgery? I hadn't actually gotten around to looking at the notebook yet, although I'd seen it sitting on Henry's nightstand when I popped into his bedroom and turned the lights on. The truth was, I genuinely dreaded what I might read in the pages of that battered, grimy-looking spinal notebook. I didn't know what was in there, but I knew I wasn't going to like it very much. I thought about it for a minute, and then I switched back. Don't say a word about this to anyone, but Henry wants me to get rid of a box of old porno mags. He was scared it might be found by the wrong person if the surgery doesn't go his way. There's some other stuff he wants me to do around the farm, but getting rid of the porn is the main objective. Michelle answered, Oh my god, really? Can you please smuggle one back home? I need to see this. <laughs> I 
I smiled in spite of myself and typed, Sorry, but I really shouldn't do that. Henry would be mortified if he ever found out. She sent a sad face, followed with, Boo! Can you at least take a few pictures? Are they really weird and gross? I messaged back, No, they're pretty tame. You're not missing much. Michelle responded with another sad face and decidedly huffy, Okay, fine. Love you. Talk to you later. I didn't like lying to her like that. But I had a hunch it would be for the best in the long run. I briefly considered another sandwich and grabbed a beer instead. I got halfway through the second beer and decided I couldn't wait any longer. I climbed up the creaky old staircase to the second floor, leaving the Beatles behind on the main floor to sing about good times and good vibes aboard a yellow submarine. I stood beside Henry's bed for a while, looking down at the spiral notebook on his nightstand, with the pins and needles feeling in my guts. The front cover was printed with a black line that was labeled Subject. Across the line, Henry had printed in capital letters, Tear to Pieces, Burn, and Destroy. I stared at those words and I thought, Maybe... Maybe I should toss this thing in the garbage and just not worry about it. Maybe that would be better for everyone. But I knew that wasn't true. It wouldn't be better for everyone so much as it would be better for me. And this wasn't about me. It was about Uncle Henry. And I owed it to him to see this thing through to the end. I took the notebook down to the kitchen table, drained my beer, and grabbed another one from the fridge. I felt like I was going to need it. I grunted, here we go, and turned to the second page. It was dated July 10th, 2016, in Henry's careful, looping penmanship. Whatever was in store for me that night, Henry had seen it coming years ago. I took in a deep breath, exhaled slowly, and read the first few words. I have a story to tell, kiddo. This time, it's a little different, because we're actually in this story. Now, before I say anything else, you need to understand something. You're not alone here. This house is full of restless spirits. I sat back and I contemplated the pros and cons of just grabbing my coat, pulling on my boots, and heading home. I was already on edge, and that sentence... Oh, that sentence was looking like a giant red flag. I downed a long swallow of my beer and grumbled. It was like Michelle was right. Fuck my life. I knew that leaving wasn't really an option, so I steeled myself for what might come next and kept on reading. Well, I'm either dead or I'm on my way, so treat this task like it's my dying wish. Believe me, I'd never want you involved with this awful business if I could help it. There's no one else I can trust to see this through to the end. Happy to oblige, Henry. I promptly choked on another mouthful of beer as I read the next two sentences. Back in January of 1981, me and your dad buried a body in the root cellar. You have to get rid of it before the farm goes on the market. I staggered over to the sink and I hacked up a small lungful of pale ale. My eyes were watering, my breath was wheezing out in tortured little gasps before fits of coughing. When it was over, I panted, holy fucking shit and leaned against the counter while I caught my breath. I turned on the radio and closed my eyes. What the hell did Henry mean when he wrote a body? As in a human body? A, a dead person? What the fuck, Henry? You want me to do what? Behind me, a rough, slurring voice answered. Ain't you a writer or something, kid? Can't you fucking read? I whirled around and tried to scream, but nothing came out but a faint hiss. My father was sitting at the table, staring at me from beneath his bushy eyebrows with a look of naked contempt in his eyes. A Pall Mall unfiltered was smoldering between his fingers. He glowered at me and stirred the contents of his coffee mug with a tarnished spoon. I could hear the whistling of his labored breathing, and above that, the tinkling of the spoon bouncing off the sides of his mug. I croaked, what the fuck, 
and a familiar stench suddenly assailed my nostrils. An unpleasant mingling of stale tobacco, dark rum, and sour sweat. It wasn't a hallucination. It was my dad sitting there at the table, a man who'd been lowered into his grave over 20 years ago. He was in the flesh and blackout drunk in a mixture of booze and primal rage, just like he'd always been when he was still alive. Got kind of fat around the middle, didn't you? He said. And he sneered at my beer gut. City man, that's what you look like. But those hands of yours are softer than a baby's backside. City men are always soft. I choked down a lump in my throat, and in a high, quavering voice, I told him, You're not real. This isn't real. Real enough, shithead. Dad shot back, and all the strength ran out of my legs. I collapsed against the counter and grabbed the sink with both hands to keep myself from slithering onto the floor. Dad gave me a ferocious smile and took a big gulp from his mug. He tapped his ashes on the floor beside him and rasped. We had to bury him in the cellar. It was the middle of January, for Christ's sake. Ground was frozen. He wasn't nowhere else to put the son of a bitch. I choked out. Dad, I don't... Is that really you? His vicious smile abruptly collapsed into a grimace of rage. He flicked his smoke onto the floor beside him, staring me down as he crushed it into the linoleum with the heel of his work boot. He growled, You ain't no son of mine. And he shoved his chair back from the table. A sudden motion toppled over his coffee mug, spilling a murky wave of rum and black coffee over Henry's notebook. He heaved himself to his feet and tucked in the tail of his work shirt with angry, jerking motions. No. You ain't no goddamn son of mine. I died alone. And where were you, huh? Where the fuck were you at, boy? I felt the blood freeze in my veins as he came staggering around the table, advancing on me with his scarred up hands balled into fists. My brain was screaming at my legs to run, but I was frozen like a deer in the headlights. I simply couldn't comprehend that it was actually happening. Dad bellowed. What do you gotta say for yourself, boy? and exploded forward with a bone-crunching left hook. I backpedaled a bare split second before his fist whistled past my chin and hammered into a cupboard door. The door bounced back and cracked down the middle from the force of the blow. I ran for the living room and Dad hot on my heels, punctuating his words with wild haymakers as he pursued me through the house. He shrieked, You ran off and I died alone. I laid on the floor with shit in my pants for three fucking days. And where were you at, boy? Where the fuck were you? Caught a glancing blow off my shoulder, and I tripped over the coffee table, landing on my back with my legs sticking straight up in the air. Dad loomed over me, and I started screaming. I started screaming like a tea kettle at the top of my lungs because the phantom no longer looked like my father. As a middle-aged man, it had become the corpse I'd visited at the visitation, at the funeral home, a skeletal caricature of my dad in a cheap gray suit. One eyelid was closed, but the other had worked free of its moorings and slid open to expose a slim crescent of white. The thing planted a rubbery, faux leather shoe on my chest and pinned me to the floor. It reached up with both hands and tore open the stitching that held its withered lips together. The sound of dead skin ripping free of the stitches made me squeal beneath the immovable weight of his foot. It leaned over me and crooned in a papery voice. By the time someone found my body, the flies were laying eggs in my eyes. It was you who done that to me, boy. It was you. The cadaver pulled something out of the breast pocket of his suit coat and held it in front of my face. It was my dad's pocket knife, the knife that I'd left on his grave back in the summer. It pulled open the rusted blade and grinned down at me, exposing blackened gums and rotting teeth. Better ask yourself something, boy. Who do you love? The gruesome apparition raised its arm to plunge the knife into my chest, and then it suddenly wasn't there anymore. It was looming over me with its decaying smile and its grotesque post-mortem wink one instant, and it was gone the next. I was sprawled on the floor for no apparent reason. Squinting up at the ceiling with my hands clenched at a shoe that was no longer pinning me to the floor. 
I went entirely limp and spent a few moments just focusing on my breathing in and out until my racing heart rate dropped out of the red. When I could finally speak, I ran a dry tongue over my lips and quavered. What in the almighty fuck was that? I suspected the incident would not be my last encounter with the unknown that evening. The old house was full of restless spirits, silent and unseen for many years. Tonight, they intended to be heard. I rubbed the painful knot in the back of my head and hauled myself to my feet, trying my best to look in all directions at once. The living room was a mess of broken knickknacks and toppled furniture. My only coherent thought was, it's time to get the fuck out of here, isn't it? Like, right now. I grabbed my coat off the floor with shaking hands. I got as far as shoving one arm into a sleeve, and then I froze as still as a statue. I could hear the tap running in the kitchen. I approached the door with my coat still dangling from one arm, my neck prickling into goose flesh, the sound of heavy footsteps clomping across the kitchen floor. I peeked around the doorframe, bracing myself for whatever fresh hell was waiting for me, and I let out a surprised gasp. It wasn't some horrible boogeyman, after all. It was Uncle Henry, but, but not as I'd seen him in the hospital, sick and sallow and thin as a rail. It was Henry as he'd been many years ago. Still hearty and physically capable in the prime of his middle years, Henry was mopping up the puddle of coffee and booze on the table with a dish towel, scowling and grumbling, a string of curses under his breath. He looked up at me and he shook his head. Look at this place, he grunted. What a god-awful mess. Always cleaning up a mess. That was life with Wally. I tried to speak several times and I, I, I failed. My tongue was stuck to the roof of my mouth. Finally, I managed to ask, Are you a ghost? Henry chuckled at me and waved the question away with his free hand. He snorted, no, I'm not a ghost. He bustled over to the sink to rinse out the towel. I don't look so good lying in that hospital bed, but I'm still breathing. Now you, on the other hand, look like you could use another beer. Come here. Have a seat. Henry tossed the dripping spiral notebook into the trash and plopped a couple of cans on the table. He sat down across from me and said, Well, my notebook got ruined, so I guess I'll just pick up the story where you left off. Now, Wally, I just saw him, I interrupted, and let out a weak little laugh. <laughs> Michelle always thought this place was haunted, did you know that? I guess she's right, I, I saw him, and, uh, he blamed me, he, you know, for his death. Sternly, Henry asked, was that him saying that, or was it you? I didn't know how to answer that, so I stayed silent. Henry cracked open his beer without any visible difficulty and grinned. Look at that. I <laughs> miss being able to use my hands. Shit, it's nice to be able to open a can and not even think about it. Now, as I was saying, Wally came back from the war absolutely full of rage. I've never seen a man angrier than him in my whole life. Every now and then, all that steam would build up in his head more and more pressure till he eventually just explode, and that's exactly what happened that night. Wally exploded, and he left a hell of a mess to clean up. But my Jesus... One hell of a mess. I gulped down half of it in one go. I stifled a belch and said, Am I losing my shit? Is this... Is that what's happening here? Tell me what's going on, Henry, because I... I'm lost. Henry looked at me thoughtfully and patted my hand. He said, Well, we're in between, I suppose. Not here or there, just kind of... You know, in between. One foot in the past, one foot in the present. And what about the future? I asked. Henry gave me a rueful shake of his head and lit a cigarette with his old Zippo. The future, he said, can only be seen in dreams. Henry drank deeply from his can and groaned. Oh, and that's some shit. And had a beer in a month. <laughs> God damn, I missed it. Uh, anyhow, I was sitting out here in the living room while I was watching TV with your aunt. 
I think your grandpa was snoring away in his chair beside us. I don't know where your grandma was. Probably in bed. Anyway. Phone starts ringing, and it's your dad. Right away, I can hear in his voice that something's wrong. He says, look, I'm calling from a gas station near the highway. I can't talk long. I need you to come to the Trenton Road. About a mile off Fairmont Drive. You see my truck parked at the side of the road. Don't tell nobody where you're going. Just come out here right away. I need your help. Uh, it was getting on towards 11 o'clock at night. Shit. Getting a half hour drive from here. I said to him, why? Way out there. Now? What's going on? He goes, I can't talk about it right now. Just get out here as quick as you can. Bring a tarp with you. Big one. Nah, I didn't much feel like going out into a bitter cold, but I didn't have much choice. Well, it was more trouble than he was worth. He was still my brother. I told Eustace that old Jonathan Sr. got his tractor stuck in the ditch. She just shook her head at me. I don't know if she believed me or not. I suppose she trusted I wasn't going to go get up to anything bad. Any other time, she would have been right. <sighs> not this time. Henry paused to have another slug from his can, and in the silence I heard the front door spring open with a click, a bang, and a faint squeal from a hinge and need of some oil. I stared at Henry and whispered, What's that? Henry raised his eyebrow and said, Yeah, I reckon it's part of the story. Go have a look. I reluctantly slid out of my chair and took a peek into the living room. My dad came creeping into view with a small child cradled in his arms. The child was me, and I appeared to be deeply asleep. I was wearing a dirty coat with a gaping tear in the right sleeve, and my flimsy pajama bottoms were tucked into a pair of winter boots. My face was thin and drawn in the dark cave of my hood. Even in my slumber, my features were pinched with the strain of living in the volatile shadow of my father. Dad laid me on the couch and carefully pulled my boots off my feet. He covered me with a knitted blanket and stood there for a while, staring down at me with a haunted look in his eyes. Softly, he whispered, God help me, boy, I could just about kill you some days. I could kill the whole lot of you. I never wanted any of you. Dad let out a long, shaky breath and pulled a flask out of his coat. He took a deep swig and grimaced as the liquor burned its way down his throat. It's the truth, he said, as he nodded in agreement with himself. I don't even give a damn, it's the truth. Dad shoved the flask back into his pocket and draped another blanket over my sleeping form. He backed away from the couch, stepping as quietly as possible as he did. Don't wake up and come looking for me, boy. Don't you dare. He tiptoed away stepping carefully as possible across the creaking floorboards. As he shut the front door behind him, the boy on the couch opened his eyes. He didn't know how to love, Henry murmured directly behind me, and I almost jumped right out of my skin. I whirled around and clutched my heart with both hands. Fucking hell, man, don't do that! Henry took a step back and grinned. Don't have a goddamn conniption fit, it's just me. Here, come sit back down. I snapped. Just wait a second. I, I remember that. What happened in the living room just now. I, I remember that. I I heard what Dad said about how, how he wanted to hurt me sometimes, but I just thought it was a bad dream or whatever, you know? Holy shit. Finally, Henry said, He wasn't right in the mind, kiddo. Trust me, it didn't have anything to do with you or anyone else for that matter. And come on, sit down. Henry guided me back to the table, taking a moment to turn off the radio before he settled into his chair. When we were both seated, he said, Okay, where was I? All right, uh, the phone call. So I drive out all the way there, and I find Wally's truck parked on the shoulder. His front bumper was banged up pretty bad, and I see there was a car in the ditch on the other side of the road. I jump out of my truck, and I holler, Holy hell, Wally, what happened? Did you get in an accident? Wally shushes me, he says, he says, listen to me, Henry. I got myself a situation here, okay? 
Yeah, I was coming out of a parking lot back in town, right? This idiot in the ditch over there. He changed lanes. He almost plowed right into me. I was starting to pull out, and I, I yelled at him. I gave him the horn. I guess he didn't like that because he started following me. I thought he'd cool down and stop chasing me after a while, but he followed me all the way out here, cut in front of me. He hammered on the brakes. I couldn't stop in time, so into the ditch he went, stupid bastard. I stared at Wally for a second, just trying to process everything he was telling me, and I said, why the hell did you call me and not the cops? Is the guy okay? Wally says, nah, he ain't okay. If you take me over to have a look, and I... Sh I shone my flashlight into the ditch, and I said to him, Sweet Jesus, Wally, what have you done? Henry pressed his lips together and shook his head. He ran a hand through his hair and said, Dad, well, your dad murdered this guy. Beat him to death with his bare hands right there in the ditch. It was, it was murder, plain and simple. I blinked at Henry and grunted. Holy shit. I had no idea this ever happened. Henry looked down at the table and muttered, No, you wouldn't. Anyhow, I looked away from the mess down in the ditch and I yelled, Fuck's sake, Wally, you really did it this time, didn't you? Why in fuck did you call me out here to help you conceal your crime? Jesus Christ, man. What the hell am I supposed to do? Wally well, grabbed my arm and he hollered, Hell, give me life in prison, is that what you want? You want me to get old and die in jail? It was him or me, Wally. You gotta understand that. I looked him square in the eye and I said, You're lying to me, Wally, aren't you? You're the one that almost caused the accident, right? You started following this guy when he told you off, am I right? You're a crazy goddamn idiot, am I right? Wally didn't say nothing. He just crossed his arms. He turned away from me. I spun around. And I yelled, why the hell are you in town at this time of night in the first place? Getting hammered at the bar, weren't you? I could smell the booze on you right away. My God, Wally, you got a wife and a kid at home. You do something like this? Have you lost your fucking mind? Wally got that look in his eyes, and I'm sure you know exactly what I mean. And I said, what are you going to do, Wally? You going to kill me too? Your own brother. Henry paused to wet his whistle, and I joined him. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, but at the same time, I wasn't surprised in the least. I'd always known my dad was probably capable of murder. When he came home from overseas, he brought the war back with him. He never stopped fighting it. Not until the day he died. The enemy may have changed, but the rules of engagement always remain the same. I started walking away from him, Henry continued, and Wally yelled, Wait! Where the hell are you going? I got in my truck, I locked the door, rolled the windows down a crack, and I told him, This is it, Wally. The end of the line for me, I'm going to pretend I never came out here. Whatever happens now, you're on your own. And Wally crowded up close to my window, his eyes as wide as saucers. He says, If you do this, my kid's going to wake up tomorrow morning to an empty house. Don't do that to my boy, Henry. Please don't do that. I switched off the ignition. I said, what? What do you mean? Myra will be there. Wally, Wally looked away from me. He slumped his shoulders, shakes his head. He goes, she's out at her mother's place for a few days. The old gal just had gallbladder surgery. and She ain't feeling too good. You know, I, I wouldn't aim it on... Being gone that long tonight, just a couple of drinks down at the bar straight home, that's all I was going to do. Henry's eyes narrowed and his hands clenched into fists on the table. When he says that, I don't know. I just saw red. I jumped out of the truck. I got right in his face. I said, you left that kid by himself and you went out drinking. He's what, six years old? Stupid son of a bitch. What, what in the ever loving fuck is wrong with you? Oh, I was heated, kiddo. You better believe it. I was 
I was ready to go toe to toe with that goddamn idiot. I didn't give, I didn't even give a shit. I, I grabbed him up by the front of his collar. I pulled him in close and I said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to help you get rid of this body. Not for you, Wally, but for your wife and your son. And I will forever have the stain of this horrible crime on my soul. But I'll do it just so that boy doesn't grow up without a dad. Even if it's a sorry fucking excuse for a father like you. And that's what we did. We buried that poor bastard. He lit up another cigarette and squinted at me through the haze of smoke. We wrapped that body up in a tarp and I helped him drag it out of the ditch. Just as we loaded in the back of Wally's truck, some headlights popped up in the distance. I turned to Wally and I said, this is our cue to get the fuck out of here. Get in your truck, follow me. I drove out to that old shack you guys were renting at the time and I told Wally that you were going to be staying with me in Houston until your mom got back. Your dad didn't like that very much, but at that point, I didn't much give a shit about what he liked or didn't like. I told him, you're not fit to look after a child on your own. You're a murderer, for Christ's sake. You just shut the hell up and you do as you're told. As Henry was saying this, bells went off in my head. I leaned forward in my chair and sputtered, I, I remember that too. I saw you yelling at him from my bedroom window. I saw you move the body. I jumped back into bed. I pretended to be asleep when I heard Dad come into the house. That's just like I said, Henry sighed. You are a part of this story. A big part, truth be told. If it weren't for you, I would have left Wally on Trenton Road to sink or swim on his own. Anyway, like you said, we moved the body from his truck to mine. I sent Wally in to fetch you out of your bed. Followed me out here to the farm and we took the body down to the root cellar. The ground was frozen harder than rock out there. I couldn't think of anywhere else that would be safe. I gaped at Henry with an uneasy mixture of shock and wonder. If I wasn't hearing it directly from you, Henry, I wouldn't believe it. Even after everything that's happened since I walked through the door tonight, I still wouldn't believe it. Hell, I'll take it one step further and say, I'm not entirely convinced this isn't a dream or something. That's the problem, kiddo. Henry observed with a dry smile. You won't believe in anything that don't fit in your worldview. <laughs> Not until it literally chases you into the goddamn living room and knocks you on your ass. You know, you'd rationalize yourself into an early grave if you'd ever admit you're wrong. You know, for a smart kid, you can be awfully fucking stupid. Henry got up from the table and pulled away the mat that lay on the floor in front of the sink, revealing the trap door to the root cellar. He pulled the handle and it swung open with a low and decidedly ominous squeal. He pointed to the square of darkness at his feet and said, The story ain't done yet. Come on down. I'll show you what happens next. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. And if you're not listening to tonight's episode of the podcast, then you can on Spotify or other places that people listen to podcasts because I only use Spotify. And if you're not watching tonight's video, then you can on YouTube and nowhere else because that's the only place I upload videos. And if you've done both of those things, then I want to say thank you for subscribing and clicking that like button and leaving a comment that's nice and friendly that I can respond to and give a little heart to. A big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Stephanie Butler, Jordan Humble, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kyle Tuna, William Wellington, Emma, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, Bastion Beefcake, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Clownable, Amber Clark, Jake Kearns, Dakota Lane Whetstone, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Arias, Estebean, Nick Cull, Our Minsect Time, Xylobones, Angelus, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Love it a Galvin, That Creepy Check, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Carolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Michael Limchok, Dirty Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Spikamel, Melted Lake, Tolly Sue, William King, Darth Miver, Sashi Sasaku, Croconut 509, Stricket, Ready Kruger, Lisa Cottrell, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Mog, Kiwi the Sloth, Fester's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. To all of you guys, I cannot thank you enough. Thank you for being a huge support to me. Thank you to everybody who's in the description down below, and thank you to everyone who can even support $1 just on Patreon to help keep the content coming. 